the May 19th, 2020 meeting of the Committee of the Whole to order. As we start today, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands of the Puget Salish peoples, past and present. We want to thank these caretakers of the land who have lived here and continue to live here since time immemorial. I would also like to acknowledge the many urban Indians in who have brought their cultural ways of life here in great our community. Today we'll have our usual, as much as anything in um, a pandemic is usual, our usual update from executive staff on the county's pandemic response. We'll then get a preliminary briefing on an ordin ordinance that would place a capital improvement bond on the November ballot that would be directed towards um, health and safety improvements at the Har Harborview Medical Center. Following that, we'll take up a proposed ordinance that would set rates and charges related to a sewer disposal um, that would go into effect in 2021. In light of our public health emergency, Governor Inslee has issued an emergency order suspending this section of the Open Public Meetings Act that requires that we have a physical space for the public to watch our meetings. This order has been extended by the governor and leadership of the House and Senate. With, uh, while meeting remotely in this fashion, we are limited in the matters that we can take up to those that are necessary and routine or necessary to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak and the current public health emergency. The matters on the agenda for briefing or action today have been determined to meet these criteria. One final house housekeeping note as we get started, um, to manage the meeting, I'd ask that the public, as well as executive and council staff, please keep your video off until just before you plan to speak. With that, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Balducci? Here. Councilmember Dembowski? Here. Councilmember Dunn? Here. Councilmember Cole Wells? Here. Councilmember Lambert? Councilmember Lambert is waving, um, and we can unmute her on our end. Councilmember Uptegrove? Here. Councilmember Von Reichbauer? Here. Councilmember Zahalai? Here. Mr. Chair? Chair. And Councilmember Lambert? Councilmember Lambert is here. I can monitor my own off and on, so please do keep me un unmuted. That was hard. I, yeah, I actually didn't do anything, so I don't know what happened. Thank you. Um, thank you. We have everybody present. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting from May 5th, 2020. So moved. Councilmember Dunn, Council Member Dunn has moved. We approve the minutes of our previous meeting. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The minutes are approved. We'll now turn to public comment. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have we have people who are on the line wishing to provide public comment? Correct. Uh, yes, you do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Having an entirely remote meeting is un is unusual for the King County Council, and I want to be sure that everyone who is called in understands our procedure for um, how we will manage public comment. Um, first, some ground rules. As usual, public comment should be related to items on today's meeting agenda. It may not be used for the purposes of assisting a campaign for election of any person in the office or for the promotion or opposition of any ballot measure. It must also not include, it also must not include obscene speech. If a speaker fails to abide by these restrictions, they can be ruled out of order and the testimony concluded. Now to, now to move to the process. As all members of the public joined to the meeting, they were automatically muted. We can see your names or the last three digits of your telephone number. Our committee clerk will call the names and, and numbers um, for those um, who have signed up in advance for public comment and or on the line that we don't um, know to be staff. When your name or three digits, um, the last three digits of your phone number is called, um, staff will unmute your line. Please make sure that you are also unmuted if you've muted your phone. And before you begin your testimony, um, say your name so we can acknowledge that we, um, we hear you. And then we'll ask you to spell, say and spell your name so we can have it accurate in the record. 
You'll have two minutes to speak and you'll hear a timer go off when you've reached your two minutes. By all means, finish your thought, but we would ask you to wrap up your comments to allow the next person to speak. If you go much past two minutes, you may be unmuted and ruled out of order. If you're listening to the TV or streaming the meeting, please turn that function off when you're providing testimony so there's not feedback. And um, once we conclude, um, once you conclude your test, we would invite you to um, monitor the rest of the meeting either through KCTV, King County Television, or streaming online on the council's website um, in order to be able to better manage the Zoom call with um, fewer participants. With that, um, I'll turn it over to the clerk to um, seek pu um, public comment. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first caller is Clayton Lewis. Go ahead, Mr. Lewis, you are muted. Good afternoon, uh, Clayton Lewis, C-L-A-Y-T-O-N and Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. So I'm here today representing the Harborview Board of Trustees on the matter before you and wanted to share that the proposal before you has the unanimous and very strong support of the board. We'd like to express special thanks to Council Member McDermott and Council Member Dombowski for the countless hours they invested as members of the Harder, Harborview Leadership Group. Their leadership and insights were critical in developing this proposal. And I'd add that I'm very honored to be Council Member McDermott's appointee to the trustees. Stating what's become painfully obvious over the past few weeks, there could not be a more important time to make an investment in the medical center. As each of you have seen firsthand, the medical center's facilities are outdated in terms of modern practices for infection control and privacy, and the older buildings on campus would pose a life safety risk during a major earthquake. In addition, given that Harborview typically operates at close to 100% occupancy, we have virtually no capacity to surge in response to an emergency, be it a pandemic, man-made, or natural disaster. As I spend time out in the community talking with the residents of King County, I continually hear that they're very proud of Harborview. And it gives them peace of mind because they know Harborview's there in case they or a member of their family has an emergency. Harborview is there to respond to disasters or mass casualty events. And they take great pride in our serving the vulnerable residents of the county and the mission population. It was impressive to watch the Harborview Leadership Group work for over a year on thoughtfully developing this proposal. And what I personally found most striking was that this very diverse group of stakeholders reached 100% consensus on the recommendations before you. As trustees, we very much appreciate the partnership we have with the council, the executive, and the stakeholders from across the community to develop this proposal. And Council Chair Balducci, we appreciate your consideration of moving this forward. This proposal provides the critical investment required for Harborview to continue to serve the residents of King County going forward for decades to come. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. And we're happy to have arranged to have this meeting online so you didn't have to try to get out of West Seattle. I'm sorry, Ms. Daly, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next caller is Lindsay Grad. Go ahead, Ms. Grad, you are unmuted. Thank you. This is Lindsay Grad, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, G-R-A-D. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. I'm happy to be speaking with you this afternoon. Um, Mr. Lewis, immediately before me, did a great job of laying out the, the broad stakeholders and the alignment that we found um, in more than a year's worth of work. Uh, trying to assess the needs of our community. Um, I can only say that uh, as we're undertaking these strange times due to uh, COVID-19, it feels really good to be part of a community that took that methodical time to plan for our future needs. Um, and when it comes to behavioral health, public health, surgery and trauma, uh, or emer emergency preparedness, um, our community truly does need uh, the measures that were recommended um, in this bond levy. Um, we, we have the chance today to um, together take action to ensure that no matter what befalls individual families or community members or our region as a whole, 
that we will have a public mission oriented healthcare system that's there when we need it. Um, whether it is um, a young child who suffered tremendous burns, uh, whether it's people who need to be airlifted into our community from across the state, across the region, or even uh, other states, um, Harborview is there. Um, we need to make sure that it's seismically sound. We need to make sure that it has a building and a cap campus that actually provides for the most um, medically sound way of delivering care rather than an outdated model. Um, and we need to make sure that we're delivering um, truly integrated care and planning for uh, the workforce of the future. So that's that's what our union believes we accomplished in this project together with stakeholders from Harborview, from UW, and from the community. Um, and we, we strongly urge this council uh, to, to look at this great product um, and we, we hope that you will recommend it to the ballot. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Gradbury. Um, appreciate the work that your members do at Harborview every day um, to make it the outstanding center that it is. And I'm glad you didn't have to leave West Seattle either. Ms. Daly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, our next caller is Nicole Grant. Go ahead, Ms. Grant, you are muted. Thank you, Council Chair and all Council Members. Nicole Grant, N-I-C-O-L-E-G-R-A-N-T. And I'm pleased to be communicating with you all today about how strongly the labor community values the remodel of Harborview. I cannot think of a more relevant or timely project, and I cannot think of one that has greater unity of purpose from the labor movement. We are um, committed to supporting the project um, through to the end and ask you for your support today as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Um, our next caller is Monty Anderson. Go ahead, Mr. Anderson, you are unmuted. Monty Anderson. Mr. Anderson, you are unmuted if you'd like to comment. Yes, okay. How, does that work? Yes, thank you very much, go ahead. Great, Monty, M-O-N-T-Y, Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E I took Maple Valley Highway here so I didn't have to cross the West Seattle Bridge so I could testify today. I wanna let everybody know, I think that where the building trade stands, on this kind of issue. King County has been at the forefront of community hire. This job would be covered under the community hire. That means the most vulnerable men and women here in King County will have an opportunity to work at a facility, build a facility, first class facility, and get middle class wages and benefits. It's gonna lift all boats here in the community and I couldn't be stronger behind it. And I appreciate all the hard work you're doing. I know these meetings are tough to put together I'm on a lot of these things, and I just want to let you know King County is doing an excellent job, and we appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Chair, I believe I've called everyone on the line. All right, Madam Clerk, would you please um, unmute every everyone on the call for a moment, please? Everyone is now unmuted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. At the risk of being chaotic, if you're on the line now and haven't had a chance to um, offer testimony and wish to, if you pl please say your name and I'll take a list. Hearing no one. Hearing no one, so I'll close the public comment. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Ms. Grant, we look forward Um, that takes us to item five. Brief, um, the uh, first business item on our agenda is to have um, a presentation from Dwight Dively, the director of the Department of um, Performance Strategy and Budget, to give us an update on the county's pandemic response. Um, Mr. Dively, um, sharp tie, the, the line is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, as uh, we seem to be doing now every week or every two weeks. Um, 
So I had six things that I thought I would share this morning uh, or this afternoon. I think they'll go pretty quickly. Um, there's bits and pieces of good news, but there unfortunately is a lot of bad news in what I need to share with you. So let me start with number one, um, which is an update on the general fund financial situation. So I believe, as uh, we all have discussed previously, that you know that our budget gap for the 21-22 biennial budget for the general fund is about $150 million. Um, that is still obviously a very early estimate. Um, it could get worse. It could get a little bit better. Uh, there are some ways to help cover that uh, significantly, including the rent for the right of way that the county council approved several years ago that the state Supreme Court upheld fairly recently. Uh, we have not counted revenue from that against that number. So that will probably be a significant tens of millions of dollars of reduction to that number, depending on the choices that the executive and council make about using that money. But having said that, um, even the things that are relatively painless are only gonna be a relatively small portion of that total. So uh, later this week or early next week, we will be sending out uh, budget reduction targets to the internal service agencies such as KCIT and FMD and to the general fund overhead agencies such as Department of Human Resources um, so that they can start thinking about ways they could potentially reduce their budgets. And then probably at the end of next week or early the following week, uh, for all the direct general fund departments, so the criminal justice agencies, for example, uh, elections and the assessor's office, uh, we will be sending them their targets as well. Uh, just conceptually, and, and uh, this is not to say that this is exactly what we're going to do, um, we are looking at something like 5% in 2021 and another 5% in 2022. Uh, we want to have a strategy where we try to phase this in as much as we reasonably can, given the high degree of uncertainty um, about the economic forecast, about what the legislature might do, et cetera. So uh, just to give you a sense of order of magnitude, that's what we are looking at at this point. Uh, so I will pause here to see if there are any questions about the general fund situation and the current approach we are taking. Colleagues. Baldicci. Councilmember Baldicci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dwight, good to see you. Uh, I, I wonder if you all are looking at um, capital differently than operating at all. There is some uh, value, as we were just hearing in public comment, to keep capital programs going, not just to maintain the things that we need to maintain, but also to provide stimulus and jobs. And so is that something that you're looking at? Yeah, and it obviously varies, council member, by fund. So uh, we are very much hoping that in DNRP, with particularly wastewater and solid waste, we can keep going with those capital projects that are in the pipeline. Um, we don't have a large capital program in roads, but we're hoping to do the same thing there. Um, I think in Metro, it will be inevitable that we're going to have to reduce the capital programs that we had expected. I think everyone knows our plan had been to very substantially ramp up Metro's capital program. Um, and that just doesn't seem possible given their fiscal situation. Uh, so we're probably not cutting much there, but we're not growing it in the way we had hoped to. Um, in the general fund, there really aren't very many capital projects uh, because we can't afford the debt service on, on the projects. Uh, we do have um, our major maintenance projects in the facilities management division. Um, and we will be looking carefully at those, um, probably more looking to see that uh, whatever we've appropriated um, actually can get spent on schedule. Uh, so one of the more general things we're doing is we're looking at monies that have already been appropriated. And in some cases, we may be able to recapture those because it doesn't appear that the project will actually proceed um, on the schedule we had originally assumed. So yeah, we are in at least some areas looking at capital different than operating. Up the Grove. Thanks, member Up the Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Dwight. Um, kind of along the lines of capital, but a little bit different. Do you see a scenario, given what's on the horizon, where we might 
use an approach that we normally wouldn't, which is using one-time funds to fill an ongoing hole. In other words, borrow money to meet next year's expenditures, you know, using bonding as a tool to close some of that gap. Um, so let's, let's just focus on the general fund. Um, I think I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's set aside for a moment, the potential that the federal government will come in with significant support. If that happens, that's great, but let's set that aside for a moment. Um, I think it was very likely we will be using one-time money to help balance the 21-22 budget uh, for the general fund, for Metro, and for MID. Um, and that's really using the reserves that were built up in the good times to help us through some of the bad times. Um, you know, we have, a, for example, in many funds, we have something we colloquially call a rainy day fund. Um, I think most of us would agree it's raining pretty hard right now. Uh, so I think we'll be using reserves on that basis. Um, our policies would basically forbid us from borrowing money to cover our operating costs. It would be um, extremely difficult to go to the market to actually do that. Um, so I don't foresee recommending, nor do I actually think it's realistic to assume we could borrow money for operating costs. What um, I think is worth a conversation, particularly if we had a belief that we might get a new revenue source relatively soon, we might think about borrowing for capital investment uh, and the job creation that it brings, you know, very similarly to the idea of the Harborview bond issue, um, where we might be looking to expand capital programs with the expectation that we would have a future revenue source that we could use to pay the debt service. That's an area that I think, I know the executive is interested in, and I think we should explore in more detail. And um, thanks. And don't take my question to be a recommendation by any means. <laughs> that was oh, no, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think we just need to have very frank conversations in this time about all the ideas. Um, you know, no one has a monopoly on good ideas. So let's let's keep having these conversations. And, I, you know, we'll come up with stuff that might work really well. Thanks. Colleagues, any other questions? On to your next item, Mr. Dively. Okay, item number two is the Mental Illness and Drug Dependency Fund, or MID Fund. Um, you know, I've briefed you before that this is the one that um, we actually have an immediate crisis with because we're going to take a very substantial revenue reduction this year. So um, the MID Advisory Committee meets next Thursday, and currently my plan is to go to that committee meeting uh, describe the financial situation, uh, which will be clearer um, by that time, and I'll get to that as my very last point today. Um, and then we are actually going to be looking to start to reduce mid-spending this year, not waiting till 21-22. Um, and we're going to focus that mostly on money that we don't think would have gotten spent this year or programs that haven't really ramped up yet. So we're trying to minimize the amount of actual cuts to currently funded programs. But even that I don't think is fully avoidable. So um, I'm, I'm actually going to, for anyone who would be interested, I'd like to offer the opportunity. I'm like, I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with any of the council members who'd like to, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the ideas we have. And I'd like to solicit some feedback about those. Um, I don't want to want, don't really want to do it in this meeting because there's a, you know, a lot of uh, things that I think uh, we're really looking for uh, uh, early feedback on before we want to announce that we're doing it. So uh, for those of you that are interested, if you can just reach out to me and let me know that you'd like to have a conversation in the next week or two, uh, I'd be happy to do that. I do want to just let everyone know that it doesn't seem like there is a path to postponing at least some mid reductions uh, until 2021. So let me pause at this point and see if there are any questions about that. Colleagues, Councilmember Cole Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dwight, you and I have uh, conversed about this. Uh, as we cannot backfill mid funding with uh, any CARES Act funding, uh, and I brought up the idea of perhaps creating a new grant program that would be uh, for mental illness, behavioral health, and so forth, that would be COVID-related. As I understand, we can do that, but we would have to expend the funds by the end of the year. 
the CARE Act funds. That's that is correct. Yeah, that under the current rules from the federal mm -hmm. government, it has to be something that's new and caused by COVID. And then all the money has to be actually spent, not just committed, but spent by the end of December. Now, those rules could change, but at the moment, what you just described, council member, is exactly correct. Okay, thank you. We may explore that. Mm -hmm. Other questions on bid? Item three. Okay, item three, um, and Council Member Colwell's had a good introduction to this. Um, just a, as a reminder, we do have, um, originally we've spent some of it now, $262 million of CARES Act money. Uh, again, the parameters on it is it has to be for COVID related costs. It can't be for lost revenue. It has to be spent by the end of the year. And it has to be things that were not in an appropriation by March 30th. So it has to be things that uh, you choose to appropriate after that. Um, we have had conversations with the executive about kind of where on the executive side, we believe the kind of priorities for that are. Uh, one of the things that I, kind of a new piece of information to share with you all is our current estimate. And again, it is a very preliminary estimate is that something like 50 to 60% of that money is gonna be needed to cover the county's costs of response. So things like our share of the things that are otherwise eligible for FEMA, um, incremental salary expense in some of our departments related to COVID response, things like that. And so the remainder, again, roughly something like 40%, is available to share with our partners, uh, to do programs in the unincorporated area, such as the business assistance that you approved last week, uh, to do programs with our partners in the suburban cities, again, like the business assistance and the Chamber of Commerce assistance that you approved last week. So um, I know uh, the council members are working with Council Member Cole Wells this week to come up with kind of your own ideas and your own priorities. We are looking forward to hearing that, and I thought it might be helpful to just give you some context about roughly how much we think we're going to need internally, and then how much might be available for partners' uh, use. The other thing I want to just kind of put in the back of your mind is we have a, a timing challenge here. So we want to make sure that we have enough money in the fall if you know, we have a significant increase in uh, COVID expenses that maybe by that point, the federal government says, hey, we've tapped out FEMA. We're not going to uh, be able to fund you at 75% anymore. So we want to reserve flexibility. In but we also want to make sure that we get as much of that money spent if we have legitimate expenses to, to use it for. So I'm starting to think of, you know, like contingent plans where we might have things that we know could get spent quickly, but we don't commit to them right now. We have the money set aside for potential use in let's say September or October, uh, where we would have queued up a program that um, if we have money to do it, we would do it. But we've also reserved it in case we need it for county expenses. So as you're thinking about priorities and that, if you could keep that complex thought in your mind about it's not just what, but when, um, if this is an unusual thing to balance. And so it, uh, I'm, I'll acknowledge I'm still trying to think my way through it. Um, I appreciate your thoughts on it as well. And so I will pause at this point and just say we're looking forward to getting your feedback, I believe, by the end of the week. All right. Council Member Colwells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dwight, we will have that information to you likely on Friday. Um, I'm working with my colleagues as well as with our new COVID leadership team, which is comprised of council members Balducci, uh, Dunn, and Dombowski, and myself. Uh, but a question on this. Uh, when, we, when you were talking about what your needs are for uh, some of the funds to go, what about the public health infrastructure? How would you see that? Would we? Would that be something you would want us to, uh, or consider coming up as priority uh, priorities, or is that something that you're already planning for 
the, the legislation you're going to transmit on June 11. So the, the public health situation is complex because they also have access to different funds. So like funds for testing and so on that um, we are working with them about. Um, we are certainly envisioning using some of the $262 million for investments in what you labeled as public health in infrastructure, you know, whether that's PPE or whether that's uh, contact tracing, you know, what all those things could be. Um, those might also be some investments that we could make now that would pay dividends in future years, uh, you know, be that equipment or training or things like that. So, yes, we are thinking about that as one of the categories of county costs within that kind of 50% but uh, to the extent that that's a priority for council members to emphasize, it would be helpful to know that. Thank you. Lambert. Councilmember Lambert. Hello. Good morning, Dwight, or afternoon, I guess it is now. It is afternoon. Uh, I missed up too. Yeah, no problem. It seems like one long day. Um, so um, I'm interested in the one-on-one. -on -one, so um, let me know when you have time. Um, Great. What I'd like to know is as we are planning the governor has made very clear what it is for each business to reopen. Has there been any direction on what is required for governments to reopen, or are we on our own to figure that out? Um, so my understanding is we are pretty much on our own to figure that out, but the same kind of general rules should apply. So as I understand, for example, the phase two, uh, where several counties have now gone to, the public health guidance would be that you still wouldn't have gatherings of more than five people who are unrelated or hadn't been together in this time. So that would obviously restrict um, how the county would want to operate. Uh, you know, we've made our own rules a little bit as we went along about roads, crews, for example, and some of our construction projects. So I think we have more flexibility, but still should be complying with those general standards that uh, the governor has outlined that are really driven by public health guidance. I know that's the view the executive has. Okay, so for things like we might need to acquire like um, hand sanitizer, automatic machines and things like that. Are we thinking about what kinds of equipment we need to buy so that when we do get there, they'll already be there? Yes, and so that's uh, in, in most of our facilities that's done by FMD and they are very much uh, on top of that. Uh, you might, I don't know if I, told this story, but uh, we actually had very early on before COVID really hit a large order placed and confirmed for that kind of hand sanitizer in the stands and everything. And uh, mysteriously, that order got canceled uh, after it had already been confirmed. So um, I don't think we ever got to the bottom of exactly what happened, but uh, we should have had all that stuff two and a half months ago and uh, somebody else Thank you. Other colleagues? Mr. Dively. All right, so the um, last three should go quite quickly. So item four on my list is just to confirm, uh, we're still on the schedule we negotiated with Council Member Colwells for the third omnibus COVID supplemental to be transmitted on June 11th. Um, and that will have um, a mix of our own costs and also other uh, you know, programs that we're looking to fund things uh, that are really with our partners out in the community. Uh, and so that we're still on schedule for that. Um, I think we need to have conversation about when the subsequent one would be. My personal guess, the sense at this point is that we would wait till August but I think that's something we will talk with Councilmember Colwells about the kind of schedule for that. And just as a reminder, you're also going to have the regular third omnibus supplemental, which we have tried to make as short as possible um, with you here at the end of May. So uh, unfortunately, you're going to end up with two appropriations ordinance at the same time, but their content is actually quite different. So uh, how you choose to uh, kind of manage and coordinate that, I, I think, is something you all need to have a conversation about. And so I'll pause on that one. Up the Grove. Councilmember Up the Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Sorry, I'm so chatty today. Um, <laughs> quite obviously, one of the strategies that is often employed with in a recession is to start making reductions sooner. So you don't have to often mm -hmm. reduce as much if you start reducing sooner. Um, and you mentioned that the mid-year omnibus is going to be fairly modest. Is it, Are we not to the point yet where we're looking at some of the big hard decisions, making some of those earlier so that they affect the second half of this year? So, Councilor, that's a very fair question. Um, what, and let me give you two answers. One is in the, the regular omnibus, um, we believe we have included only things that we really have no choice about. And I'll just give you a preview. Uh, there have been some costs for medications in jail health that have been um, far higher than anyone anticipated when the budget was adopted. They are medications we have to provide. We don't have any choice about it. And so we need the additional appropriation for those things. So we have basically said no to um, a lot of things that are probably good ideas but are optional. Um, and then so the second response I would share is, um, we are sort of informally starting to save money. So uh, Department of Human Resources is looking at every position that is offered um, and making sure that uh, we really need to fill those positions. Uh, departments are actually operating this way already. The, the number of, of positions being filled has, has just tumbled from February to March to April. So a lot of departments are already managing that way. We we entertained the idea of trying to do mid-year general fund budget cuts. And I just have to say it was my opinion that to try to do COVID mid-year cuts and the biennial budget all at the same time was frankly, I think beyond our capabilities to do. Or maybe I'll just say it was beyond the executive branch's capabilities to do. So we are trying to do the, the sort of informal thing of slowing down hiring, not filling positions, um, looking at ways to find efficiencies and save money this year. But in terms of actually trying to legislate general fund budget cuts this year, we just decided we could not make that work. And we also don't know if we're going to get the federal funds. So we may end up I wouldn't want us to do something rash and then find out we're getting some help for a year or two. So. Correct. Yeah, that was, that was another consideration that went into it. And again, we can't count on that, but if it were to happen, I'd hate to have, you know, laid off 200 employees and then said a month later, oops, sorry, you can have yep. your back. Thanks. Don. Councilmember Don. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dwight, thanks again, uh, as always, for appearing here. You know, I'm hearing... <clears throat> that this is you know, a very, very significant recession, even potentially borderline the term, the D word, the D word is used. And I don't mean Dallas. I also don't mean divorce. <laughs> um, but, you know, and so obviously serious economic consequences here to this situation economically. And I heard you say, I think I heard you say a 5% reduction in the general fund this year and a 5% next year. So 10% over a, a biennial budget season. Why aren't we instituting a full hiring freeze immediately, uh, early retirements, um, and considering layoffs right now? Why aren't we attempting to try and manage this in the direction we know it's going to go? Yeah, so Council Member, let me, um, and maybe at least three responses to that. So first of all, I want to make sure it's clear to all the council members that these 5% reductions I talked about, again, are just estimates. But those of themselves are not going to fill $150 million. So those are on top of a bunch of other things, um, you know, including, uh, you know, ramping down compensation growth, including using reserves, including the rent for the right of way, all of those things. So the overall amount of budget changes we're going to need is way more than just 5% in on average across the general fund each year. Um, a second response around the idea of a hiring freeze is we sort of de facto already have that with what is happening with departmental behavior and uh, what the Department of Human Resources is doing. Um, in my professional career, I have administered five hiring freezes. Um, I have found them to be very blunt instruments because 
I think as everyone knows, there are a lot of positions that realistically can't be included. So if you think about for the county, uh, all the 24 seven positions, so sheriff's deputies, corrections officers, wastewater treatment plant operators, 911 dispatchers, um, all of those kind of positions, uh, if you freeze hiring, then you're just paying overtime and you don't save any money. Um, then there are all the positions where people have good plausible arguments about why you want to fill them. So you have to create an exceptions process. So, you know, anything that brings in revenue, um, arguably you need to create an exception for. So in my experience, the amount of work it takes to actually do the hiring freeze and have committees to review applications for exceptions, um, frankly, dwarfs the savings you have if you're just managing well instead by, by you know, being conscious about the positions that you fill. And then the third response to your observation, um, to do layoffs now, um, at least in like the general fund, would necessitate the council making a bunch of budget decisions about what your priorities are. And this comes back to my conclusion, at least on the executive side, that we weren't really in a place to be able to do that right now. Um, and so, you know, the, the trade-offs between funding for public health versus funding for the sheriff's office, the trade-offs between funding for homelessness versus, uh, you know, what we don't know about the future of our jail and what the jail population is going to be when the justice system kind of gets back on its feet. Um, it just felt like to try to go in and say, well, let's find 200 people to lay off right now um, without clear policy guidance from the council, which I don't know how you would do right now, uh, we didn't feel like we were in a place to do that. Now, there are a couple of funds that we may be to that place right away, and it's funds that we don't have a lot of flexibility about. So one is MID, uh, given that it only has the sales tax as a revenue source, uh, we're going to have to deal with that sooner, as I mentioned earlier on this call. And then the second one that I think I've also mentioned in the past is the permitting division of Department of Local Services. Since they are fully supported by revenue from the permits that um, are sought by applicants, um, if the volume stays down as much as it has, uh, we will be in the position of needing to do one of two things, which is to reduce staffing either through furloughs or layoffs uh, or a combination thereof and or backfilling them with general fund, either as a grant or as a loan. And frankly, we are right at that position now. And you will probably in the June 11th supplemental uh, be confronted with that decision unless permitting volume suddenly spikes back upward, which I don't think anyone expects it will. So long answer to your question, council member, but I think we are doing uh, in the funds that we really need to do it, we're taking more immediate actions. And in the funds where we have a little more time to think our way through, like the general fund and Metro, uh, we're trying to save money now without really going into the big, deep cuts right now, given all the uncertainty we face in those programs. I appreciate your response. I know that's not the easiest question that you can be asked. Uh, but I think, you know, with the salaries and benefits being such a huge portion of our overall budget across all the agencies, I just wanted, I need, I felt I needed to. The final follow-up question, Mr. Chair, and I won't ask another after this is, is simply this, Dwight. Is there an upper limit that uh, you in the executive office are prepared to spend dealing with the homelessness housing issues right now uh, related to the pandemic response? Have you set any kind of a bright line there or are we just spending what we need under that set of circumstances? Thank you. Yeah, council member. So I, there's two answers to you and they, they vary depending on the time. So this year, because that kind of activity is eligible for CARES Act funding, um, we haven't set a bright line, but we have a lot of capacity to do that. I don't think we're going to do a lot more of it than we've already done, but we do have the financial flexibility for the de-intensification uh, work. Um, assuming we don't get additional federal money uh, what we're going to be able to do in 2021 and 2022 is clearly more limited than that. So DCHS and many other partners are thinking about, you know, how can, how can we not go back to what we had, but how can we do something that's affordable 
um, that also has as minimal community impacts as we can come up with. Um, I, I think, frankly, this is going to be one of the hardest issues that we struggle with on the executive side, and then you're going to struggle with this fall in the in the council phase of the budget is, you know, what do we do with shelters and homelessness and housing uh, if we're in a place where we're really reliant only on our own existing funds? Uh, and there are going to be some very difficult trade-offs um, in that uh, policy area. Thank you, Dwight, for your responses on both. And Councilmember Dunn, I've noted that was your last question for the meeting. <laughs> very, very good. Agenda, by your own admission. <laughs> um, anyone else? Councilmember, uh, Mr. Diveway. Okay, last two things. Um, so uh, last week you approved funding to the Department of Local Services, $4 million, most of which to go to unincorporated area business support. And um, I just wanted to let you know, I talked to Director John Taylor today. Uh, they are very close to having the outlines of how they actually want to do that, the criteria for awards and so on. And so they will be reaching out to council members um, probably starting three to five days from now to run those by you for those who, of you who are interested. Um, and then they will proceed once they get that feedback to actually uh, deploy that program. So I was... I was very impressed with the work they've already done, and I think you will be too when you hear from them. And then my very last point on my list is um, on Friday of this week, we will get our March uh, figures from the State Department of Revenue. Uh, this will be the first actual post-COVID financial data we have. So March will obviously be the the first month that was really affected by the stay home orders, by the uh, shutdown of many of our businesses and other kinds of economic activity. Um, and so that'll actually ground us in a real number as opposed to just the estimates that we've made so far. Uh, so on Friday, our Office of Economic and Financial Analysis will get that information and obviously can share with anyone who is interested. And with that, I have finished my report for this afternoon, unless there are further questions. Colleagues, Councilmember up the group. Uh, thank you. It's a busy day for me, I guess. Dwight, you mentioned uh, the local government <coughs> was getting ready with their criteria to administer those funds. The funds that are outside of the unincorporated area I know there was an intent to consult with council members. Should we just be proactive if we had suggestions or do you anticipate something that's a little more formal? Will someone be reaching out to us? Uh, that's a great question, council members. So what we are doing, so there are um, two different grant programs that you funded in uh, my office's budget. So the one you referred to, which is the basically suburban cities uh, business assistance program. And then there's also the, the funding for arts science or arts education science and live music venues. Uh, we are similarly developing criteria for both of those uh, funds and we'll be reaching out to council members probably late next week uh, with that. So you're welcome to proactively send us your thoughts, but uh, we also will have a process of checking in with council members about each of those programs if you're interested. Okay, so emailing Curran would be the best sort spot to start. Um, yeah, sure, that, that that will work fine. And oh. he'll get it to the right people. But currently we are uh, planning that Kelly Carroll, who most of you know, will actually be the project manager for the uh, arts education, science, and live music venue program. And then Michael Jacobson and a team that is set up within public health will probably take the lead on the business support program in the suburban cities. Thanks. Further questions for Mr. Dively? Councilmember Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Have we done any estimation about how we could help with some of this by bringing on some of our businesses slowly but surely? so that we can have income starting up as some of these other things are hitting us? 
Um, other than the business support programs that you uh, approved in last week's supplemental, I am not aware of anything else that we are doing just in general with business. There's a lot of conversations uh, between executives office and business groups where they're talking about things. But in terms of like an actual county program, I don't believe we have done anything. Um, you know, as you know, council member, other than one staff person uh, in the uh, in my office and one person in the Department of Local Services, we don't have an economic development program because we don't have enough money to do one. Yes. And if you hold on just one second, I'm going to get you a website that I would like you to um, for everybody who has a business across the county, I have permission to say that you can borrow liberally from this website. It's called backtoworktoolkit.com. Um, so let me repeat that, backtoworktoolkit.com. It was a version of what things you need to think about as a business to go back to work. And it was highlighted from one that was done by the city of Seattle which were larger businesses, and then they adapted it for smaller businesses. And the writer of that um, list has said, anybody can use it. So um, I was very impressed with that list because it gave you things to consider that you might not consider without having somebody else go, did you think about that? Because there's so many things to think about. So that toolkit is out there and I hope it helps people but when I look at that list, um, I think that um, the sooner we can get people sharing some of these things and opening up some of these smaller businesses who can comply with the six feet, as that revenue comes in, there'll be less and less businesses um, over time that will have to be um, holding up because they will be able to hold themselves up. So um, I'm looking forward to, to the helping the balance there of opening up and getting that tax revenue too. So, yes, and Hugo, Hugo has been very busy. We've been on the phone with him regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Further questions when we have Mr. Dively? Well, I'll be here for your next two topics as well. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, um, your briefing. And that takes us to item six. Our next item is proposed ordinance 2020-176, which would place a $1.74 billion 20-year capital improvement bond on the November 2020 general election ballot for health and safety improvements at Harborview Medical Center. In order to put the item on the ballot, the last regular council meeting to adopt the proposed ordinance with maximum processing time is July 7th. Today, we'll get a pre preliminary briefing to begin our deliberations on this item. We have Sam Porter and Nick Bowman from, um, from Council Central staff um, in the meeting to brief us and answer our questions. Ms. Porter, Mr. Bowman, the line is yours. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sam Porter, Council Central Policy staff. I am on page 11 of your packet. Um, as the chair mentioned, proposed ordinance 2020-0176 would place a 20-year $1.74 billion capital improvement bond on the November general election ballot, the proceeds of which would go toward new construction, renovation, seismic retrofitting, and other health and safety improvements of Harborview Medical Center facilities. Attachment A of the proposed ordinance provides a high-level overview of the improvements, which may be funded with levy proceeds. These improvements were based on the Harborview Leadership Group recommendation report that was transmitted to Council on April 8th of this year. This report, requested through Council Motion 15183, provides background and detail on the Harborview Leadership Group efforts and summarizes the size and scope of the bond recommendation. Under the proposed ordinance, this bond would result in an average rate of approximately eight cents per thousand dollars of assessed value, over the life of the bond. According to executive staff, a median value home would see an average increase in property taxes of approximately $68 annually over the life of the bond. In order to meet the elections department deadline to include the proposed bond on the November ballot, the last regular council meeting to adopt with maximum processing time, which is 25 days, 
is July 7th. As you know, uh, Harborview was founded in 1877 as a six bed King County Hospital in South Seattle. It is now licensed for 413 beds and is located on the western edge of First Hill in Seattle. Harborview is the designated disaster control hospital for the region, and it serves as the only level one trauma center in the four state region of Washington, Alaska, Idaho, and Montana. Harborview prioritizes serving the non-English speaking poor, the uninsured and underinsured, people who experience domestic violence and sexual assault, incarcerated people in King County's jails, people with behavioral health illnesses, particularly those treated involuntarily, people with sexually transmitted diseases, and individuals who require specialized emergency care, trauma care, and severe burn care. Harborview is owned by King County. It is governed by a 13-member county, county appointed board of trustees and operated by the University of Washington. Harborview's capital facilities have evolved over the years, and while Harborview has funded much of its smaller capital improvements through annual budget and capital facility planning, as the owner of the hospital, King County has provided uh, for major capital facility improvements and expansions through voter-approved financing, um, the most recent which occurred um, in 2000. And that was a $193 million bond to fund seismic and health and public safety improvements for the facilities. As by way of background, in July 2018, the Harborview Board of Trustees sent a letter to council identifying six areas for focus for a capital plan and acknowledged that there needed to be a need for a wider planning effort. In response, council passed motion 15183 which created a planning process for a potential bond to support capital improvements at Harborview that included um, uh, composing a leadership group. The Harborview leadership group consisted of representatives from the county executive's office, county council, Harborview, UW Medicine, for the First Hill community, and Harborview's mission population. The leadership group fulfilled their charge when they transmitted their final recommendation report after 13 months of analysis and deliberations on the issues outlined in the motion. And they are, uh, they appear on page 13 of your packet and include an evaluation of the size and scope of a potential bond effort, exploration of the possibility of private philanthropy, an evaluation of inclusion of the needs of the Department of Public Health, an evaluation of housing needs for the mission population, evaluation of the needs for the Involuntary Treatment Act or ITA court, an evaluation of how best to address behavioral health needs, whether bond proceeds should be invested in public health facilities beyond the campus of Harborview, and whether bond funds for other public safety infrastructure needs should be included. The final recommendation report was approved by the Harborview Leadership Group, the Capital Planning Oversight Committee, of the Board of Trustees, the Board of Trustees themselves, and the King County Executive in accordance with Motion 15183. It was transmitted to Council in April and provides background and detail on the efforts and summarizes the size and scope of the um, recommended bond. Table one on page 13 of your packet um, outlines the different components recommended in the Harborview Leadership Group report, and they I can go through each one of these and then and then I will um, hand the presentation over to my colleague. So the first item on this table is a new bed tower. This would increase the bed capacity, expand and modify the emergency department, meet privacy and infection control standards, disaster preparation and the plant infrastructure. And this would be $952 million. The next line is a new behavioral health building. This would house the existing behavioral health services and programs and the new behavioral health institute. These would be under one building and this is proposed at $79 million. The next line is existing hospital space renovations, which includes expanding the ITA court in the most appropriate location, move and expanding the Gamma Knife um, program, uh, moving labs um, and moving the public health tuberculosis and STD clinics um, and also modifications to the medical examiner's office and a number of other offices. 
this would be $178 million. The next line is Harborview Hall, which would include seismic upgrades and improving and modifying the space and creating space for up to 150 respite beds. Um, this would also include maintaining the enhanced homeless shelter in the most appropriate location, and this would be $108 million. Next would be the center tower. This would include seismic upgrades and improving and modifying the space um, to be used for offices. This would be $248 million. Next line is the Pioneer Square Clinic. Um, these improvements would be seismic and code improvements and modifying the space to allow for um, better clinic space um, and office space. This would be $20 million. Um, $9 million would go toward demolishing the East Clinic building and $146 million um, fall under site improvements and miscellaneous expenses. Those are outlined um, in the last line on page 14. And attachment A to the proposed ordinance provides a high level outline of the improvements which may be performed with bond, uh, bond proceeds. The contents of table one, which I just went through, are reflected in attachment A, which can be seen on page 31 of your packet. And now I will hand things over to my colleague, Nick Bowman, who will provide you um, more detail on the financial analysis and the timing of the proposed ordinance. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, again, Nick Bowman for the record. Uh, as Sam stated earlier, the proposed place a $1.7 billion capital improvement bond on the November general election ballot. The executive envisions issuing a series of 20 year bonds over several years to finance the proposed improvements to the HMC. Uh, council staff analysis finds that the average rate across the life of the bond would be approximately eight cents per $1,000 of assessed value. Uh, this translates into an average increase of $68 annual, annually on a median value home. Again, those are uh, averages over the life of the bond. The actual tax rate in each year of the repayment period will be based upon the annual debt service for the outstanding bonds. At the beginning of the project, the rates will be comparatively low as the debt has not been fully issued yet. Uh, at the end of the repayment period, the rates will also be comparatively low as the initial debt will be nearly repaid. During the years when construction is at its peak, the debt service load and therefore the debt service cost will be at its highest and so will the annual rate. Uh, while staff esti has estimated that the average annual rate will be $0.08 cents per $1,000 of assessed value, the actual annual rate will vary between less than $0.01 cent to $0.12.5. Cents. Uh, additionally, uh, as the debt will be issued in a series over several years, the levy will remain in effect until the principal on the last series of bonds has been paid in full. Current estimates from the executive envision the last series of bonds being issued in 2029. As the proposed ordinance limits any bonds issued to a maximum duration of 20 years, uh, the rate may continue in effect until 2049. Though the proposed ordinance does not prohibit the early repayment of bonds or the issuance of debt maturing, maturing earlier than 20 years. Table two on page 15 of your packet shows the estimated debt issuance schedule and its impact on the annual tax rate. Uh, as the table shows under current estimates, interest payments over the life of the bond will be approximately $643 million, bringing the total debt service cost to approximately $2.4 billion. Table three on page 16 of your packet illustrates the estimated change in rates over the repayment period. You can see in table three that the rate rises in line with the issuance schedule to a peak of about 12 and a half cents in 2029 and then gradually decreases as more of the debt is repaid until the final several years where the rate drops off considerably. It should be noted that these estimates are based off of the August 2019 OEFA forecast. As such, the economic data does not include the financial impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the financial analysis for the proposed bond will surely change as the economic impacts of the pandemic are realized and accounted for. Uh, according to the executive, an updated OEFA forecast will be available in late May or in early June, and a revised fiscal analysis could be provided to the council by June 15th. Uh, before I move on from the financial analysis, uh, was there, are there any questions you'd like me to go over? Colleagues? Councilmember Member Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple of things. Um, the 2000 bond for $193 million, when is the payoff the date on that bond? The it was the last payment was made. One second here. So 
is this then taking us um, to $68 above what people were paying back then? Um, or is it on par plus because it's going to be 3.2 um, as opposed to $193 million? Um, is it $68 more or um, can we subtract what was part of the payment before? My understanding is that we are in the final years of the repayment period for the initial 2000 bond. Uh, and then, so this would be additionally $68 on top of that. But the, uh, as uh, if you look at the table, the, the actual, I think the, the uh, average impact of the medium home value in the first couple of years is in the first five years combined is less than a hundred dollars. And then, so that the repayment period, for the initial uh, 2000 bond will be, have been completed and we'll start paying on the new, uh, taxpayers will start paying on the new bond should they approve the development. And then is 3.25% interest still the best interest rate at even at this point post COVID? Uh, that is my understanding from executive staff, but I'll let them expand upon that should they like. Okay, and Mr. Chair, just one last thing. On the medical examiner's office, I'd like to know more. I am concerned about the fact we've co-located death and birth certificates it's very difficult for somebody that's going in to get a death certificate for their child to be standing next to somebody with a bouncing new baby getting a birth certificate. Um, I'm interested in surge capacity and also proper storage, um, which I believe um, is not up to what we need to have. So I'd like more information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dombowski. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Following up on Councilmember Lambert's inquiry, the, the table shows a three and a quarter percent uh, interest rate, which then on top of the principal drives the estimated mill rate per thousand of assessed value. And I'm just um, wondering, I was looking at the CAFER, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and our current portfolio it looks like it has a range of two and a half to five percent uh, bonds. I'm wondering what... Um, Dwight or our central staff sees, I know it's hard to predict that far out, but uh, wh what do you see today, given that that was last fall's estimate, what do you see today on, on borrowing costs? I think we would defer to Dwight if he's available. Yeah, have I been unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay. Um, so obviously right now, the interest rates available in the market are significantly lower than that. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, interest rates probably on 20-year bonds of less than 2% if, if issued today, uh, particularly for voter-approved uh, bonds. Now, over the life of, you know, several bond series that we would be issuing, as your staff explained, it's unlikely that rates will stay that low. So three and a quarter was kind of conceptually an average over that period of time. It probably is a little higher than we would do it if we set out to do it today, but still something like 3% is probably a reasonable average. Uh, so the results would be a little lower than what you're showing here, but probably not a lot. Further questions? Please proceed, Mr. Bowman. Okay, moving on to uh, bond timing and voter turnout requirements. Uh, table four at the top of page 17 of your packet provides the November 2020 general election processing deadlines. Uh, as you see, the last regular council meeting to adopt the proposed ordinance with the maximum processing time of tw uh, 25 days is July 7th, and with minimum processing time of 10 days is July 21st. Uh, under state law, a general obligation bond ballot measure requires at least 40% of the turnout in the preceding election and a 60% yes vote to be approved. Uh, according to the King County Elections Validation Summary for 2020 bond measures, a turnout of approximately 180,000 voters would be needed to meet this 40% participation threshold. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to touch briefly on the construction timeline and permitting. Uh, table six on page 18 of your packet shows the executive's estimate of project phases and timelines should the voters approve the bond measure. Uh, phase one, selecting the project management and design teams would occur in 2020-2021. Phase two and three, which involve design, space planning, and sequencing, as well as permitting, would occur in 2021-2023. And phase four construction would begin in 2023. 
Though it should be noted that these are just initial estimates and all timelines are subject to change. Uh, that concludes the staff report. Uh, staff and legal counsel analysis is still ongoing. And with that said, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, it was really my honor and pleasure to be able to serve with Councilmember Dombowski on the um, Harborview, Harborview Leadership Group that, as Mr. Lewis um, said in his uh, public comment today, um, initially um, gathered information about various needs and priorities, um, weighed those, um, and unanimously made a recommendation to the Harborview Board of um, Directors, Board of Trustees, who has made the recommendation to the executive that is now before us. Um, while we always knew that seismic upgrades and some of the other work included in the, in the proposal was going to be vitally important, um, we know now in the middle of a pandemic even more about the life-saving work um, and imperative need that Harborview provides to our community every day, um, in particularly infection control and in converting um, hospital rooms to um, single patient um, so that they don't lose um, access to some number of licensed beds um, for infection control purposes. We've seen um, since we finished our work at the leadership group um, exactly how imperative that is. Um, and we were very mindful of the ITA court um, and Harborview Hall um, providing those respite beds so that again, the maximum capacity of the hospital was preserved. Um, Harborview remains a gem in our community and um, this is a great opportunity to brief and introduce the bond measure um, to us and then look for surface questions. As staff indicated, um, staff work and research is um, still going on um, with the goal of taking action on this um, in time for the November ballot. Um, Council Member Nabowski, it was um, a pleasure to serve with you on the Harborview leadership team. And I'd be happy to um, turn it over to you for any comments, questions mm -hmm. as, as well before we open it up generally to our colleagues. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And the, uh, the uh, privilege of serving with you is much appreciated and I really enjoyed the joint collaborative work. Uh, I want our colleagues to know how serious this group of experts under uh, took took this work to be over an extended period of time. We really went and got the best help we could get. Um, we brought patients uh, and clients to the table in a meaningful and equal way. Uh, frankly, some of their comments and inputs were the best <laughs> from my perspective. They really helped shape this package. Um, it was a very impressive process. We use some outstanding consultants to help cost this out. Uh, what this does is it brings this critical piece of infrastructure into the 21st century and will prepare us to carry on for the number of decades ahead uh, that we need it to. Uh, it is the only uh, level one trauma facility for the WAMI, right? The Washington, uh, Alaska, Idaho, and Montana area. So if, if someone's hurt seriously in those areas, they come here, as you know. We have the incredible burn unit uh, there. We have the wonderful clinics. What's exciting to me about this is um, a number of things, but it, it, I want to highlight for you the investment in the Behavioral Health Institute. It sets us up to have really the leading comprehensive system of clinical care and research in the behavioral health arena in the country. It's a great partnership we have with the University of Washington Medical School, and I think it's a, um, uh, a really key point. I thought a lot about Councilmember Dunn and his leadership in this area as we worked on that, and, and this institute, I, I really commend it to you to look at. Uh, it builds on the investment this council has made in recent years as, at getting uh, Harborview Hall, the old nurse's dorm, partially open. As Councilmember McDermott noted, uh, this COVID crisis has really demonstrated uh, the need for this resource, for example, on the going to single patient rooms, uh, but also for handling folks who are at the edges coming in or out of um, the medical care system. We've used the shelter space at Harborview Hall for surge capacity. Uh, the 
where the leadership group made a recommendation to preserve 100 shelter beds, which is what about what we've delivered there, about 85, but about 100 shelter beds in the most appropriate location, but then add 150 respite care beds. In our research, we identified respite care, and that's folks that are coming out of uh, medical care, but don't really have secure housing or stable housing to go to. That respite care, that transitory bed need as a high priority, so they don't fall back into the cycle of needing the more costly uh, medical care that takes up beds and emergency room space. We put 150 respite care beds uh, into this proposal, and I think it will really uh, pay dividends. There is a new tower here, a a new emergency room, um, and it preserves the Pioneer Square Clinic, uh, a a very important footprint. So uh, it's it's not a small tab. I think there is a silver lining here in that the timing, while I would normally be reluctant to go in this time where we have approaching 20% unemployment and serious uh, economic disruption, go to the voters with a request for more revenue. The revenue on this and the charts important doesn't really come on for three or four years. I think Nick noted the first three or four years, the total impact might be $100 cumulatively. So that's a that's something to keep in mind as you assess this. And I really want to, again, wrap up by saying the process was robust. I have a high degree of confidence uh, in the results, and I encourage you to look at it, ask hard questions, test it against your values and goals, and I think it'll come out favorably. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Thank you. As I said, a pleasure. Colleagues, questions um, for um, Ms. Porter, Mr. Bowman now? questions we can bookmark for a future um, committee meeting. Rod, I think they love her work. They're speechless. I, I'm not that I'm not I'm not that ready or optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're just preparing the hard questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Councilmember Lambert. Thank you. Yes, we were speechless. But um, I want to say also that I really appreciate the fact that you put in um, space for a dedicated caregiver um, in the rooms. I think that that is a very important thing. And um, having spent many nights in a chair in a hospital, um, having dedicated caregiver space where you can actually lay down is a very good thing. So I think you really thought about the whole needs of the people. Um, being cared for as well as the people caring for the people who care for them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no further discussion on this item today, we will look forward to taking it up further. And that takes us to item seven on our agenda. Final item um, is proposed ordinance 2020-186, which rates and charges related to sewer disposal that would go into effect in 2021. We have Mike Reed of council staff. I'm with us to brief us and answer our questions. Mr. Reed, the meeting is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mike Reed, staff of the council. Um, so this is on, begins on page 317 of your packet. Um, I'll provide a little bit of context first. Uh, so the sewer rate pays for the operations of the wastewater treatment division and for capital construction, as well as for the repayment of debt of past capital construction. The sewer rate is actually set in coordination with the 34 cities and sewer districts who are partners in the system. Uh, they, those entities actually collect the sewer rate from rate payers and forward it to the county. They also assess a local rate in addition to the county's rate. Uh, the sewer rate for 2021 is proposed at $47.37 per uh, residential customer equivalent or RCE, which is basically just a, a flow volume measure uh, that is the expected amount that a, a average single family residence will generate in a month. Um, so uh, the $47.37 is about 4.5% higher than the 2020 rate of $45.33. Now, this rate is actually revised uh, downward from the rate that was initially proposed when the agency first surfaced uh, the rate proposal, which was that rate uh, proposal had been 9.5%, which some of you may have heard about. Um, I'm going to refer to table one on in the packet, uh, and that's on page 318. Uh, that shows the pattern of rate increases in recent years and the projected uh, increases in coming years. Um, so in the Brightwater years, uh, Brightwater actually uh, completed construction, I believe, in t- uh, 2012. Um, but So in those years and the years 
immediately afterwards, the rates were averaging in the 10% and higher range. Uh, in the last few years, they've been uh, quite modest, so 2.5% uh, increase uh, for uh, 2019 and, 20, and 0% in 2020. Um, 2021 is a 4.5% increase, and you'll see that uh, on the table that uh, it's projected that we're going to be returning to the 10.5% or 10.25% and higher rate increases uh, in 2023 uh, and forward. Uh, those are alternate year increases. So the second year of the two year uh, rates would be a 0% increase. Um, so very briefly, the, the, the increases in, uh, in the current year and future years uh, are uh, driven by a couple of key factors. One is uh, there uh, is a management asset inventory that uh, needs to be addressed because of the aging physical plant uh, that, that the uh, agency manages. And then secondly, uh, there's a need to complete the combined school overflow projects by 2030. And that's a deadline that's mandated by court, uh, cons court mandated consent decree. I wanna to refer to table two on page uh, 319. That's the capacity charge table. Uh, so uh, the capacity charge is assessed uh, for new connections to the sewer system. Uh, the proposed increase is 3% uh, from $66.35 per RCE uh, to $68.34 uh, per RCE per month. Uh, that level is consistent with increases in recent years and uh, future projections are at the same level. Um, so the staff report also notes that, uh, that rate payers um, uh, pay both the county and the local city or sewer district rates. So I, I included in the staff report some selected, some examples of selected rates for local agencies. Um, and they, they range, uh, and these are just uh, um, uh, examples, but they range from $13.97 uh, per CE per month to $35.70 uh, for those selected examples. Uh, I'll go to table four on page uh, uh, 321 of your packet. Um, and table, table four, um, uh, uh, provides information on um, the revenues of the wastewater treatment division. Um, so those revenues are increasing uh, uh, by about 4.1% in uh, the coming uh, rate period, the 2021 rate period. Um, it's important to note that because we are uh, facing uh, the COVID-19 emergency and uh, the economic impacts related to that emergency, uh, it's, uh, there are potentials for impacting the the uh, the revenues for the agency. So uh, uh, potential impacts could could uh, include um, the fact that uh, flow volumes will be uh, coming more from industrial and commercial accounts, I'm sorry, less from industrial and commercial accounts with the shutdown of businesses and, and uh, much of the commerce of the region and more, fr uh, more from um, residential accounts. Residential accounts are at a flat rate, whereas industrial and commercial accounts are at a rate based on volume. And so potentially gonna see a rate uh, a revenue impact from that. Uh, also, you heard uh, uh, Director Dively mention uh, the impact of lower interest rates. Uh, lower inter interest rates nationally mean lower return on uh, investment income for the agency, but it may be offset by lower interest rates on bond issuance that the agency initiates. Um, thirdly, uh, there uh, is, as you know, a decline in building permit applications and construction activity and those declines may result in fewer uh, new connections, meaning uh, lesser, uh, lesser revenues from capacity charge, um, or if not lesser, then lesser, uh, lesser increase in, in growth. Um, th these changes will play out over time. Uh, they have, uh, have not had enough time yet to incorporate those into these rate projections, and so uh, we will see that those over time. I wanna to refer you to, to table uh, six, on, six and seven on page uh, 332 which show the uh, operating and uh, capital expenditures. Uh, I'll note that those uh, that uh, while there are some notable increases in operating expenditures, the capital expenditures are more erratic uh, with increases up as much as 33% in 2026, uh, 2026 and decreases uh, uh, in 2024 and 2025. Um, those capital expenditures are heavily driven by the status of individual capital projects, um, whether they're in the planning, uh, design, or construction stages. Uh, the staff report does list a number of major capital projects that are underway. Uh, I'll take you to table eight um, uh, now, and uh, let's see, table eight's on page 324. Uh, um, so uh, that uh, table highlights a difference in rate projections from last year versus uh, this year. Um, you'll see, for instance, that, and I'm gonna take you forward to 2030, uh, so last year, um, the rate projections indicated that the rate for 2030 
would be $61.84. This year, the 2030 rate projection is projected at $74.83, so a significant difference in the rate projections for the future. Um, the executive has noted uh, one key driver of the rate increases is the inventory, as I indicated earlier, of asset management projects that need to be undertaken. Um, so just for context, you'll, you'll recall that the value of the wastewater physical plant of the treatment plants, the interceptor pipelines, the pump stations, the regulator stations, is estimated at about $4 billion. And that's those are plants on the ground or in the ground. Um, the staff report cites the code section that mandates uh, that the agency keep up with needed repairs and upgrades uh, to the system. A uh, chart one on page 325 of the packet um, is a map of the uh, sewer interceptor network by age. And you'll see that the, uh, the lines colored in red are the major interceptors that were put in um, uh, about 50 years ago or in the uh, 1960s. And you'll see uh, uh, colors of tan and yellow. Those were all preceding 1970. So they are uh, at or nearing 50 years of service life. Uh, table nine um, shows uh, on the next page shows uh, that um, about 53% of the system is 40 years old or older. Now, there was, as you know, associated with the uh, Lake Washington cleanup and the startup of Metro, there was a construction boom. Both the uh, treatment plants were built in the 19, early 1960s, and uh, many of these interceptor lines were built at the same time. And so they're aging at about the same rate and, and uh, are going to require um, uh, service uh, in one way or the other uh, at about the same time. Um, so, so chart number two on page 326, uh, that shows um, uh, that there's about a, there's an inventory of about $700 million in priority asset management unfunded inventory. Um, the the uh, staff report notes that, uh, so, so that's the other key uh, piece of it. There's one other major driver, and that is that the, that, um, and the staff report discusses uh, the need to meet the uh, combined sewer overflow consent decree deadline of 2030. Um, and there are a number of major projects remaining, which are, again, addressed in the staff report. Uh, those uh, need to get underway pretty soon in order to meet that 2030 deadline. And I'll note uh, that there is a letter from the Metropolitan Water Pollution Abatement Advisory Committee. That's on page 337 of your packet. Uh, that, uh, that new pack letter notes that, that the committee would have referred a 0% rate increase for 2021 in light of the economic impacts of the COVID-19 emergency. And they also are requesting uh, extensive consultation in the preparation of the 2022 rate. A, a note about timing. Uh, so as noted uh, by contract with the local sewer agencies, the rate is required to be effective by June 30 of each year. To accomplish that, a public hearing and possible action date is scheduled for the May 26 council meeting with a fallback action date for June 9. I have talked with wastewater treatment division staff um, uh, noting that um, the committee may have questions this afternoon, and uh, they and I will attempt to answer as many of those as possible. We will take notes on the other ones, and I've indicated that they will need to turn those around rapidly if uh, there is an intent to be ready for the uh, May 26th Council meeting for action. And finally, I'll note that there is one technical amendment, and that would correct an error in the financial plan, and that, uh, that financial plan is on page 335. Um, uh, that uh, uh, technical amendment was, was distributed to members uh, and staff this morning. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Um, questions of Mr. Reed? Here, here, Mr. Chair, I might also note that, that Dwight Dively, Heidi Popacek, the financial manager, and Mark Isaacson, the director of the WTD, are also on the line and available to respond to questions. Councilmember Dombowski. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mike, thank you for the staff report and the excellent tables and graphs. This is a very complicated budget given the role of rates and debt service and policies. But um, you've mentioned two times in your uh, staff report the need under the consent decree to complete the CSO facilities. And the C combined sewer overflow facilities have gone wildly over our estimated costs. And it was my recollection that we have put kind of a freeze on or we're slowing down the construction of those to kind of reassess our strategy with respect to complying with the consent decree to determine whether or not there weren't more cost-effective ways that we could achieve our Clean Water Act 
goal and obligations, goals and obligations. And so I'm just wondering, is that still kind of our, our strategy? Do we still have to meet the 2030 deadline? Is there uh, any effort underway to go back to the federal government and say, listen, we want to have more flexibility on how we meet it and also on the timing such that our cost profile to get there might be different? That may be a marked question or I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it is, it is a marked question, but let me say quickly, uh, so uh, yeah, the, the, there have been active communications between the Wastewater Tre Treatment Division and I believe the State Department of Ecology and uh, the federal EPA on exactly that question. That is, um, if we were to try and achieve the highest, the highest impact on water pollution is the best way to uh, hard, hold to these hard dates or to move those out a little bit and potentially um, look to some some uh, alternate approaches towards meeting those those uh, water pollution control goals. Um, I'll let Mark uh, add to that. Uh, Mark? Good afternoon. Thanks, Mike. And, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member Dombowski. Yes, we are. Uh, well, there's, there's really two parts and an answer to that. First, we uh, have briefed the RWQC and are working with MUPAC and working with our community representatives uh, around creating a clean water plan. Uh, we plan on transmitting that to council by the end of 2021. And it will look at a, uh, an array of issues of which one of them would be uh, the regulatory components around uh, the CSO program. And just as Mike said, and you alluded to, not necessarily... Um, wanting to back away from the commitment for clean water, but uh, that was, those, those requirements were put in place around 2012. There may well be better technology, there may well be better strategies that achieve the outcome for less cost or for better costs, better, better investment for that uh, in the receiving water bodies. As to the uh, adjustment to the 2030 timeframe, um, we do not have any permissions to adjust that timeframe. Through that clean water planning, we are asking the question because it is the single largest component of our capital budget and is driving many of those upward costs that you see in the out year, especially from 2025 to 2030. We are actively engaging in a negotiation process with the Department of Ecology, the Department of EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Department of Justice, uh, who administers uh, the federal consent decree. So, um, we've just begun those negotiations. We want to conduct them in parallel and we'll be briefing council on any uh, changes to that goes. Um, what we are asking for there is more flexibility to adjust our spending plan um, for some of our immediate uh, milestones on at least one or two of our projects. But we are also asking uh, to parallel that with some of the work we're doing on the clean water plan regarding uh, some flexibility and some adaptability regarding changes to uh, climate conditions, uh, adjusting for cost increases that have come into play, especially around construction and real estate, uh, as well as the new technology. So I hope that answers your question. I'd be happy to uh, go into any further detail that I can. But at this point, the 2030 deadline has not moved. I, thank you, Mark. I understand it hasn't moved, but uh, do you expect that it will? I mean, the negotiations have been going on for some time. I mean, we're. Let me ask you this: What are we asking the federal government, as a as a as a local government, to do in terms of time? Are we asking for five more years, ten more years? We, we have not specifically put this specific request on the table for them. We have specifically asked them through an initial letter these interim milestones, and we've got interim milestones for establishing like facility plan, going out to contract, having substantial completion. For a couple of two of our big projects or two of our smaller projects down in the Duwamish area. And the reason we want to actually move those out is because we've got one really big one that's due it by the end of 2030. And we think that we could achieve a better water quality outcome if we combine some of those projects. City of Seattle is also involved in those discussions at that table with us. They have projects in the area. We may well be able to be more efficient with the public's dollars, have less impact to the community down there at a better better investment uh, if we coordinate that through, but it would require some changes. Um, we have mentioned the 2030 timeframe as something we want to look at, and we got head nods around the table saying we understand that you would want to look at that, but no commitment. Um, maybe a, if I might, Mr. Chair, one or two more follow-ups. I'm, I'm, as I indicated in the Harborview deal, I'm reluctant to, at this time, advance a rate hike on small businesses and 
renters and homeowners uh, as we would be hopefully either getting through or maybe starting to come out of this uh, COVID-induced recession with near 20% unemployment rates. And I know we have, um, you're asking for 4.5% this year, the MUPAC has recommended zero. I'm, I'm wondering what the impacts, Mark, would be of, of going zero this year. And I know we were zero last year and doing the 4.5% in 2022. And I know when I say this year, I mean 2021's rate hike, because that's when this would apply. Um, what is the status you know, of our rate stabilization reserve to help get us through as the department um, undertaken any cost cuts? What would the magnitude of those be? Could you get there if, if we wanted to, instead of going zero in 2022, go zero 2021 and, and four and a half 2022 or some hybrid? I know we like to keep it even for two years under our partnership program. Right. Uh, we have asked for a, a one-year rate. The executive has asked for a one-year rate increase and then evaluate uh, really what's going on with the asset management program, which is a big part of our drivers with our MUPAC agencies and with council and the RWQC. Uh, but your question, I'll take it a couple fold. I didn't write notes, so if I didn't get to something, remind me, please. Okay. Um, you know, the department is, as Dwight had mentioned early on, uh, we are looking at all of our uh, vacancies, you know, any cost cutting we can do, any discretionary spending, which isn't large uh, on our component, eight, on, on our uh, budget. Um, our vacancies, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm hesitant to go a hiring freeze on, on that for, uh, for some reasons. Um, I have virtually frozen all of the administrative positions that we have in the division that are vacant right now, uh, but our, but our uh, maintenance and operators, I have wanted to keep a, uh, I would say a full deck or a, a full bench in place right there um, for reasons while we have weathered through the COVID crisis uh, and I'm crossing my fingers and my legs here um, that we have not suffered uh, illnesses or in fact our absentee rate is quite low. Uh, people are quite committed to it and taken the uh, safety precautions. Um, I, I cannot be guaranteed that and I want to keep that full bench to ensure that if we should get hit at the plants by some illnesses, heaven forbid, um, I, we want to do our absolute best to keep it fully staffed so that we can protect the public health uh, that we are in charge to do for the 24-7 operation. So that was that piece and what we're looking at. We've also, you know, through through the work of my colleague Heidi and her team, they've done some uh, interesting work around uh, debt service, uh, annual debt service savings. Uh, I think we put in $720,000 in savings just through refinancing uh, and done some interesting work on that. Um, uh, we've also gotten some grants, energy grants and such, but uh, your second part of your question, or maybe it was, was the first part and Oh, what would be the impact of zero in 2021? Um, one of the, you know, those charts that Mike had, I don't have them in front of me here, but they do show uh, significant increases in the out years of investments in part to what we spoke about with the CSO program. Uh, in part to what we haven't spoken about is we are also expecting some increased costs due to uh, nutrient uh, caps put on by the Department of Ecology on all 70 wastewater treatment plant operators into the go into the sound that would be an extremely costly uh, adventure for us and hit us in those out years we do not have cost estimates nor do we have a definitive element of that uh, from department of ecology um, they started out with a five-year planning effort and now have gotten down to actually wanting to put in a, a cap uh, the impact of zero what would that mean um, our team has done some initial look at that we would estimate uh, the deferral of 12, about a dozen projects, I would say 10 to 12 capital projects that are currently going on. Our 4.5% uh, rate increase is a maintaining the status quo. It is not any additional new projects. We would have about a dozen projects that um, about uh, that would be delayed. I don't, uh, we don't cancel projects. Uh, we delay them. I do have canceled them when the subject matter experts say, hey, we no longer need this. And we can achieve it another way. Uh, but that's not often. We've got projects um, that was mentioned by Mike regarding our uh, four to five billion dollars in assets. Uh, we've got over 55,000 pieces of equipment in that asset uh, program. Uh, and so we're continually upgrading, uh, refurbishing and replacing that equipment. Those 12 projects, um, it, it, we're not in the budgeting phase yet. And if, you know, once we have our direction from council, the policy direction on the rate, we will do that budgeting. 
but those projects are uh, on the books and ready to go or in either engineering or for construction. They are all projects that are critical towards uh, preserving uh, the integrity of the system, whether it be a conveyance project um, or whether it be a pump station or whether it be a facility at the plant. I've got several projects that uh, I think it was mentioned, the seismic upgrades to the hospital. We've got seismic upgrades that would be delayed both at South Plant and West Point. Uh, should they hit, be hit by a large earthquake, would make those both those plants inoperable uh, without getting those projects underway and going. Those are uh, quite important. Um, so those are the kinds of projects that we're looking at. We've got a number of uh, of uh, Generator replacements uh, that need to be done on. We all know during the storm events, many of you have experienced this in your districts where in major storm events and the power outages, our power plants, at the, I mean, our treatment, our, con our pump stations, I'm sorry, are all run on backup generators. Uh, some major projects is to upgrade the aging backup generators as well as the electrical systems. Uh, and finally, um, and I can get into more detail, people ask questions about that one, but uh, finally I'd like to say on the operating side, um, early estimates are about somewhere between five and six million dollars of operating costs would have to be reduced. Um, I, I, I would not be able to necessarily find that in uh, uh, travel expenses, of course, but um, or vacancy positions. And so um, we would be likely uh, reducing some positions, uh, could, could well be staff positions on the operations and maintenance side on that, uh, depending on, uh, somebody had mentioned the uh, voluntary uh, uh, program for uh, early retirement. It'd be something we would be looking at. We would of course be looking at uh, vacancy positions, but um, we haven't done that detailed budgeting. Uh, I think I saw an estimate where 5.8 million results in about, if you were just to take it in positions, about 30 to 35 positions. So that's a, a thumbnail on my uh, impacts of zero, which is why we wanted to go to 4.5. Mark, thanks. Just real quickly, 12 projects out of how many projects, how many capital projects? Would 12 oh. would be made? Um, I'm going to hazard a guess on this one. And I'm, you know, I would say uh, off of about uh, 65 mm -hmm. projects. And uh, how, so many million, have a, how many millions of dollars would be delayed I'd say by a year out of out of millions on the books. I mean, give me a you, give me a magnitude here. <laughs> I, I I'd like to give you back. Uh, I'd like to get back to you with that magnitude. It'd be better. I think we're estimating somewhere between fifty and hundred million dollars in projects would have to be delayed um, for twenty twenty one. We spend. Well, what's the rate? Probably, what is yeah, four and a half? What does four and a half percent generate in terms of revenue? Yeah, I, uh, Heidi's on the line and she'll, she'll speak to that. I see her smiling on that one. I would say our capital program uh, spends somewhere between 250 to 300 to 350, depending on the uh, where the projects are in their staging. We spend more during right. during. I'm just having trouble rates. understanding how, because it's not $100 million of rate hike, how that delays $100 million of projects by a year. And then finally, I don't want to take too much more time here. I Someone, I would like them to address the status of the rate stabilization reserve to be able right. to kick it a year. Right, we've got several reserves and I think Heidi's prepared to talk about that. Yes, thank you, Mark. And thank you, Councilmember Dombowski for your questions. Heidi Popachok, Wastewater Treatment Division, Financial Services Manager. So um, with the rate stabilization reserve, we've historically have maintained a $46 million threshold. And as Mike mentioned in his staff report or Mr. Reed, um, we don't, know what the COVID impacts would be as far as our revenues to the utility. We are monitoring as that information comes in. And, um, and mind you, with our billing uh, methodology, we are delayed by four, the uh, four quarter rolling average of how we bill our uh, contract sewer agencies. So we won't see the real impact of the COVID-19 um, uh, impacts until next year sometime. However, we have formed a project team within WTD to closely monitor those um, impacts as they come in from, uh, when just working with the uh, sewer agencies and, and just understanding uh, the impacts that are working, that are happening with them at this time. And then your other question, um, it was relates to the operating side, right? Just to confirm. 
Well, I'm, I'm not sure, Heidi. Nice to see you and thank, thank you for the answers. But I'm trying to understand the four and a half percent, just real basically, how much the money does it generate? Oh, that's this. Yeah, for so, the first year. Yeah, for the first year, it's about $20 million. Got it. And the stat- and the rate stabilization reserve account has 46 and a half million in it. 46 and a quarter. 46 and a quarter. Okay. All right. And um, we don't, uh, it's a, finally a very interesting point. I assume we've talked to some of our larger partners like Seattle Public Utilities or the Rent and Wastewater Treatment uh, Utility. They must know here, March, April, they've had a couple of billing cycles. They must know, say, on commercial accounts, whether or not they're not, you know, whether or not the volumes are down and to what degree. Uh, I mean, do we have any? Intel on that, because you're concerned, if I understand you, about just direct revenue reduction from the current account base and what that means. Correct. And um, yeah, so we should have that information uh, coming in since it's, you know, May 19th. Um, so we'll, we can certainly get back to you regarding what that looks like. Okay. It, that might, I mean, it seems like that would be interesting. Um, and whether it's a blip or a whatnot. So my concern is, colleagues, that um, these are unprecedented times with the uh, with things going on. And I don't, I think we should take a hard look at this and determine whether or not it's an absolute must do, or whether there are some things we could do to, to uh, ease the burden on our businesses coming back online, and our homeowners and renters who are paying the utility bills. So I don't want to do anything that would damage the finances in a way that they can't be repaired, but we've got a pretty, we've got reserves and um, there's timing issues. And when MUPAC is, our partners are saying go zero. I mean, that's an knowledgeable base and we're, we've got to step up here because this has not been referred to the Regional Water Quality Committee because of the stand down. So I think it's important we take a, our time and make sure we get this right. Mr. Chair, Lambert. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Dively, are you raising your hand and off mute to speak? Yes, if um, I had a further thought for Council Member Dembowski, if it's appropriate. Please. So <clears throat> one other consideration to think about is wastewater is going to be going to the bond market uh, this summer, both to do refundings to save money and to borrow new money. And if you read the rating agency reports, one of the most important factors in the current very high bond rating that the wastewater utility has is the council's demonstrated willingness to raise rates. And so a, they will see 4.5% this year and 0% next year very differently than 0% this year and maybe 4.5% next year. Uh, particularly given all the financial uncertainty around the, the revenue that wastewater will get from commercial accounts. So, you know, if there's a, if, if there are thoughts about doing something that's significantly less than four and a half percent for 2021, I just encourage you to think about how the, the bond market will react to that. Uh, just coincidentally, last Thursday, we had a meeting with our county financial advisor and he was talking about this very thing. And so it, it might be of interest to some council members uh, to hear from Mr. Shelley about uh, this issue if, if you would like to, and, or, or I'm happy to discuss it more. But I do want you to be aware that that's another uh, consideration you need to keep in mind as we go into this. Thanks. Dwight, thank, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. That's, those are, I'll remind colleagues, the same financial advisors who about a year ago said, well, we've got to speed up paying cash for our capital projects because we're on a watch. Uh, and that was going to lead to a 10% hike <laughs> in rates, which was the original de proposal. I do credit the division with dialing that back in recognition of this. Uh, but I don't know, Dwight, I, I know there are jurisdictions around the country right now that can't sell municipal mm -hmm. bonds, that the market just won't have them. And I think there's going to be an appetite for ours. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not in the, it's not my business every day, but I have a sense that we are um, well rated and that doesn't seem like a deal killer to me, but uh, anyway, it's a, it's a helpful thing to keep in mind. I mean, let me be clear. I'm not implying that um, 
if there were no rate increase, the bond market would not purchase wastewater's debt. Uh, but I think you would see a change in the rating very likely and therefore higher costs that are not confined just to the near term. As you know, once you have your rating go down, it's really hard to get it back up. So I just want council members to be aware that that is another factor in this. Uh, again, not to the point where you would say, well, the market will close us out, but it would have potentially some long-term impacts. And we also have a bond uh, coverage separate account for, for uh, almost like insurance there, right? In addition to the rate stabilization reserve. Yeah, we, you're right. We have to maintain a, a coverage ratio. And one of the things that um, wastewater is it's actually- like, It's like two and a half times the service amount or something. Yeah, it's, uh, if I remember right, it's one and a quarter is the ratio. Um, and they've done some work about that. One of the concerns, again, about doing a zero rate increase or a much smaller rate increase is you lose that revenue from that calculation. And if some of the more, uh, you know, if, if like the hotels stay shut down for another three months or the commercial office buildings are largely out of operation and water volumes really go down that much and therefore the revenue for the division goes down that much, uh, you can get very close to those ratios, which would be very problematic. That's that's where you might not be able to access the debt market. So and that's, that's why I, I'm surprised we don't have some quick reads on that from our big utilities ready to go now so we can understand that. I mean, that's a big, that, that would be important. So I would appreciate if it's possible, this is your recommendation, I know, but what are the options that the council has? MUPAC's recommended a zero, but a chart that says, if you did this, these are the pluses and minuses. You know, we're, we're now faced with just your recommendation and the mm-hmm. kind of surrounding facts and rationale, but it, are we being, it's, it's a difference between saying approve or make a decision on options. And right now it's approve or don't approve. Okay, so I think that's a fair request. And conceptually what we might be able to bring back to you is if you approve two rate proposals now, one for 21 and one for 22, what would that look like? Mayor Lambert. Council, Council Member Lambert. Thank you. As you know, I'm the chair of the committee, um, the Regional Water Quality Committee that oversees this. So prior to the um, pandemic, we were um, very deeply involved in the very questions that Council Member Dambowski was asking. And the, the rate that was coming over at that time um, was 9%. So when we got pushed back from our partners, the amount was cut in half to four and a half. So I think it's important for us to know that. I'd like for pa- Heidi Papachok to come back on for a moment and answer two questions. What is the, um, the amount of money per month that we are talking about? I think the answer is $2.36, but I want Heidi to say what the correct answer is. And then also, um, Heidi did a very extensive uh, research on what really would need to be done to be very prudent in making sure that we're keeping up with the um, maintenance of our pipes. And we've had a number of issues with some of our pipes that, because of corrosion, have actually um, collapsed. And we had an issue um, last year in Auburn where we um, had a a 20 to 30 foot drop in the road and we had to go in and redo about 172 feet. So luckily nobody was in the road at that point. But um, if Heidi would tell us those two things, I think that would be very helpful information for people to have. Is Heidi there still? Yes, council member. Um, so I will speak to the monthly um, per uh, the monthly uh, amount that you asked about for the sewer rate, and then I'll defer to my uh, colleague, Director Isaacson, regarding uh, the other question on that. Um, so with the executive's proposed sewer rate, the monthly rate would be forty seven dollars and thirty seven cents, and that's a two dollars and four cent increase and that our um, contract sewer agencies would see. Since we are the wholesaler, we will uh, charge those to our contract sewer agencies when, and they will then pass it on to uh, their customers. 
So um, I was off by a few cents, so that's good. So $2.04 is what we're talking about, different from what people are paying today. And while I realize there's a lot of stress going on in the lifetime cycle of not doing what needs to be done and letting it get worse and causing more damage, um, that is very helpful. I, I know you said to pass it on to the um, director, but the list that you showed me of the top projects that needed to be done, um, do you remember how many projects were on that list? Uh, Council member, are you referencing our asset management yes. list? Yes. Yeah, so I will defer that question to Count, uh, Director Isaacson. Okay. Okay, go ahead. So, um, the asset management program, I think we had a, a list that we wanted to start beginning the initiation of our projects uh, in 2021, and that was the original proposal, the 9.5. Uh, that included about 40 projects to initiate uh, that. It's not the complete asset management program of 700 million. Those are the most critical ones. And there were 17 in the conveyance program, uh, six projects at our offsite facilities, uh, and about, I would say, 19 to 20 different projects at our uh, treatment plants, West Point and South Plant. Now, a little bit on those. Uh, you know, um, it, you, you referenced the project, the emergency project that we did down in Auburn, I believe on M Street, the downtown area of Auburn. Uh, that is a, part of our, uh, is a part of our ongoing asset management program. Asset management is really a part of a, it's got a maintenance component that's done every single day. Uh, from our staff that work on our projects, as well as a capital program. On the maintenance side of that, we have an inspection crew that goes out uh, and they TV our conveyance facilities and they look for, essentially they look for rot, I like to say. Uh, they look for uh, facilities that are degraded. It's a highly toxic environment down there. And uh, this was part of one of our older facilities. And uh, I think it was the hydrogen sulfide had built up enough uh, that degraded it enough. Uh, they did an emergency repair. I think you referenced about 90 feet of that. Uh, we will go in and do a further repair on that about two to 3,000 feet later this summer. I would, minor correction, uh, we didn't see the drop yet. This TV crew saw that it was about to, and we placed a steel plate over the intersection until we could make that repair. But that's a part of this and a good example of our program. Uh, that program, I would say, um, has been significantly upgraded under the council's leadership uh, they asked us to, after the West Point flood, we really took a look, hard look at our um, strategic asset management plan. And that really came out with uh, completed inventory, accurate condition assessment, and then a framework for really refurbishment and replacement uh, and repair of, our, of those 55,000 assets that I spoke of. Uh, since that 2018 uh, work, since West Point, um, we started that list. The vast majority of the initial high priority projects were completed. Uh, we still have the list that you see today or the, what we've included in that uh, $700 million uh, component. I would say that um, we evaluated the projects that came through by a series of teams under uh, in, our, in our conveyance teams as well as our uh, maintenance folks, as well as our planners and our operators. And they prepared a risk portfolio based on four factors, which I think are really important. Um, the condition, the reliability, meaning is it within two years of its expected life, uh, the risk of failure and that consequence of that failure. Uh, that's a bit of a judgment call on that, but that we have the professionals on that. The one that's intriguing to me the most that caught my attention is obsolescence. Those initial projects that we identified uh, were all projects that either had the most wear and tear on their uh, conveyance system or the parts for the, the pumps and the facilities at our plants uh, were obsolete. In fact, that our parts could not be purchased and so that we were re uh, trying to make maintenance repairs on something that uh, we needed to replace the entire piece because uh, as time goes on, um, the parts are hard to repair. And sometimes when you bring in a new part, it isn't compatible or copacetic with the rest of the facility or the rest of the uh, piece that it's working from. And then finally, this one's interesting to me as well is, as a, from an operations guy, it's the, it's the uh, demands on staffing. How, our, we have uh, key performance indicators for our maintenance crews. We have targets on what we expect them to accomplish on maintenance. We also measure uh, planned work versus break-in work or versus uh, unplanned work. 
And that's when we have a lot of unplanned work on a piece of equipment that is called break-in work, meaning it's just taken away from our preventative maintenance work. Uh, we start to see that that piece of equipment needs to be uh, replaced or repaired, and we have our reliability engineers. So that's the that's the essence of of the program and what's generated that list that you speak of, uh, and why we wanted to initially get that going under the 4.5 in 2021. Uh, we would delay them uh, and start really uh, delay them by a year. Uh, depending on our work. I would also say we look forward to working with our MUPAC uh, component agencies. Uh, they were aware of asset management. They were not aware of the details behind that. And for that, um, they should be, and they have every right to know that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so I think what I'd, I'd like to say is that um, this total would be less than $25 a year increase. And what it would accomplish if you look at part two on the um, backlog of the asset um, management inventory that is unfunded that needs to be completed i think it's really important and from my opinion you know the saying goes pennywise pound foolish and i would adapt that in this situation say pennywise ton foolish because we absolutely have got to get this taken care of and the sooner the better and I think looking at all the projects, and I just want to call out the great work that Heidi did. If you um, would like to know more specifics, the chart that she did was awesome. And of course, we won't say it was because she was trained in our department, but um, she was good before and great still. So um, anyway, I think that that is very insightful of what it is that needs to be completed. And when you see what it is, the sooner we can get started, the cheaper it will be. It will only get more expensive. And we are talking about $2.04 a month. And while I realize we are in tough economic times, we just talked about putting out a $68 a year um, bond. So um, when something needs to be done, it needs to be done. And as again, this is less than $25. And um, it is a very different than what was originally proposed at 9%. And um, because part of this will be the clean water management study, which will be what, two years in completion? Is that how long it will be, about two years? Uh, the end of 2021, we expect to have it transmitted to council. So we'll have lots of discussions going on, but this is a baby step in getting to the right place because we have lots of other questions that are very extensive that we will be needing to get into. So. Um, this is an exciting time to be dealing with this, but it's also a lot of work ahead. So um, thank you for bringing this forward and I look forward to working on it more. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Reagan Dunn. Go ahead, Council Member Dunn. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark, yeah, I share in Councilmember Dabowski's uh, comments and, and concerns, and 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 and, and I want to see some scenarios that look at more of a flat rate or nearly a flat rate, um, and then uh, look at cost uh, pushing back to year two and beyond. Um, I am also very concerned about any kind of a rate increase this this year, so I'd like to see those scenarios as well. Thank you, Councilmember Belducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I could have just gone ahead, but I wasn't sure if you were okay. <laughs> um, I just want to, uh, I, I want to ask, I, I guess, a similar, make a similar request to what's already been made. And that is, I, I sitting here today, couldn't really um, articulate the crisp, like full list of things that are what this rate is buying us, this rate proposal is buying us versus if we did a different rate proposal. I, I heard a lot of different things and it all kind of, but I, I heard like sort of long-term stuff mixed in with short-term stuff. And uh, it would be really, it would be much easier to address the concerns that we're hearing um, if we could get a better explanation for the difference between, you know, the real difference between 4.5% and some lesser number. Um, I'm not sure that that's been well communicated. And, you know, the, the contrary argument, 
it's a financial crisis that people are seeing. How could we put even a couple of dollars a month onto them more? Is that's a really compelling argument, right? So we need to explain what our proposal, as you know, as a wastewater treatment division, is why that's compelling. And, and I'm just still not I'm not quite hearing that. And it might you might need to follow up with that, but um, that's the ask I have. Thank you. All right. So we've heard that from, uh, we've heard a couple concerns um, and series of questions, more information um, from our colleagues. We have legislation in um, committee now and would have and would anticipate um, bringing it to full council next week. Are we interested in moving it to full council, being open to the idea of council relieving it of legislation, relieving it up, up from this committee next week? Councilmember Colwell, you're the prime sponsor and you've got your camera on and your microphone off mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm prepared to make a motion if you so wish waiting to hear the pleasure of the chair and the body. Um, the chair is one guy in this committee. The chair would be happy to have you make a motion. <laughs> Councilor Belducci, you want to chime in? Yeah, just uh, from the perspective of uh, council action, uh, my understanding is that while we are uh, scheduled to <clears throat> we have scheduled time to take this up next week, if if members feel it really could use some more briefing and explanation, I understand that it is possible to do one more uh, round of committee meetings and still pass it on time at council. I, I'm not recommending that. I, I would be fine uh, based on what I understand of our meeting next week to move it forward to next week. But I understand it's not a drop dead thing to get it out of committee today. Councilmember Balducci, Mike Reed, uh, that is correct. Uh, so you have the option of either acting on May 26th. I should say that the public hearing is scheduled for May 26th. You could either act then, or you could act uh, basically two weeks from that date, which is the June 9th uh, meeting. That would be the last date that you'd have to move it forward on with a regular schedule. So. Uh, Mr. Chair? Councilmember Member Wells. Uh, another option would be to uh, move it without recommendation to the council. You're right. I'm, um, if we were in chambers now, I might see heads nod or heads not nod um, in that um, I only see a couple of heads as I saw nodded. And I'm not sure how, if I if we should read that as kind of a will of the body council member Colwell's or not. To, why don't you take the bull by the horns and see what happens. I'm seeing the same thing you are. I could go ahead and make that motion. Okay, with that, um, I move proposed ordinance 2020-0186 relating to rates and charges for sewage treatment and disposal uh, be given, be uh, passed to the council without recommendation. Council member Colwell's has moved that we move um, ordinance 2020-186 out of committee without recommendation. Is there a discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, we do have an amendment though. Um, council, which is technical regarding the financial plan. Council Member Paul Wells. That's right. uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move amendment A, uh, which would uh, swap out the incorrect financial plan for a revised one as we were alerted this morning uh, it needs to be done. Thank you. Council member Cole Wallace has moved adoption of amendment A. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it, the amendment is adopted. Discussion. Lambert. On the motion as amended, Count the ordinance as amended. Council member Lambert. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that um, the water department um, has 
wastewater department has um, put a very long time of work and effort into analyzing exactly their needs and um, came out with a number. And then when things started happening, they, um, with our partners, they cut that in half and said that that's what they thought was prudent. If you look at their work, um, I believe that it is prudent. And we've had um, two of our budget experts talk about that that's what they believe is prudent. So um, I think that when we go against the people who have studied something for years um, and believe that this is the best, um, it's, it's worth our time to get into um, the, the numbers. And um, so I definitely support the idea that um, I am very thankful that experts have done this good work and have been willing to present it. So if you haven't had the presentation privately um, to get into that depth, please do, because I think it will be very insightful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Councilmember Dombowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I understand this is without recommendation, but I believe there are too many unanswered questions and not enough choices to be advancing this today. I appreciate all of the excellent work that the Wastewater Treatment Division has done, um, but their mission is to look at the wastewater disposal and clean water needs and financing what, what they need to run their program. Our job is different. Our job is to do that, but to also account for the other public factors such as the economy, the need for businesses to recover. We're not talking just about $2 a month on a, on a residential unit, although that's not insignificant. But we're, we, have, we have no data before us on the impact to small businesses, restaurants, coffee shops, manufacturing plants that pay, pay, pay the bill and what it would mean to them. Uh, I'm just, I just don't think we should be advancing this at this time without options to realize the other issues that this council should take into account. So I'm not going to be able to be supportive today. Maybe those questions will be answered between now and final uh, uh, action at the council. Thank you, council member. Further discussion? Council member call what? No? All right. Um, then I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council member Balducci? Aye. Council member Dembowski? No. Council member Dunn? No. Council member Cole Wells? Aye. Council member Lambert? Aye. Council member Uptegrove? Aye. Council member Von Reichbauer? Council member Von Reichdauer? Council member Zahalai? Aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. Mr. Chair, the vote is six ayes. Council members Dembowski and Dunn, no. And Council member Von Reichdauer, excused. Council member Dunn, are you um, online at the moment? It was Von Reichdauer. I'm sorry, Von Reichdauer? I see him in the Zoom meeting. Um, all right, by your, by your vote, we have advanced ordinance 2021-86 as amended to full council without recommendation. Um, Thank you, Mama. Should, um, I'm looking to council member Balducci here um, and maybe council member Cole Wells regarding the need to expedite it to full council next week. Mr. Chair, Balducci. Please, Councilmember Balducci. I have a question, uh, and then I'll defer to Councilmember uh, Cole Wells. I heard uh, Mike Reed say that we have a public hearing scheduled for next week. Uh, that's correct. Uh, we are required to give a 10-day notice uh, for public hearing that's published. Uh, we've done that. Uh, the public hearing that we targeted was the May 26th uh, uh, date. Does the item need to be on the agenda in order to pr have that public hearing? I believe you could you could uh, pull it from uh, Cal to do a public hearing and then return it to Cal if you chose to. But yes, it has to be, I believe, well, that's more a legal question. So I, I'm gonna defer to uh, to legal staff. My rough understanding is it does, does need to be in, in, in uh, council before a public hearing. 
but I would, again, look for a final answer from, from legal staff. So I'm guessing that uh, it might have to be expedited in order to make the public hearing be legitimate. That was my that was the uh, reason for my question, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Balducci, this is Wendy. I will say if uh, to move it out today, I believe you would want to expedite it. Otherwise, you would not be able to take action until that following uh, mid-June council meeting. Right. I mean, we might we might end up doing that anyway. My question is really about the right. So, so there's two issues. I'm sorry. Let me say this. State this differently. Issue one is whether we need to expedite to have the public hearing, and I'm hearing that may be the case. Issue number two is if we don't expedite, we lose the opportunity to act next week. We don't have to act next week, but we would lose the opportunity to act next week if we chose to. Right. Just to put the facts out there. Councilmember Colwell's. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we expedite proposed ordinance 2003-0186 to uh, the council for its May 26 meeting. Without objection, we will we will expedite um, to preserve the legislation being in full council for the public hearing on the 26th. Seeing no objection, um, so ordered. With that, it's Councilmember von Reichbauer. Are you unmuted? I received a text from Councilmember von Reichbauer that he was working to unmute on his end. Council member, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this is Wendy again, and I will just note again that you do have the ability under the council rules to email the clerk uh, an affirmative vote uh, in favor of the majority recommendation um, if we continue to have technical difficulties. I have a, I've just received an email from Council member Von Reichbauer addressed to me the, um, Melanie Pedroza, the clerk of the council, and Angel Angelica Calderon, um, one of the clerks for the committee, um, that, which reads, please record my vote as no for the sewer rate vote that just happened. Additionally, please make sure that I'm unmuted on your end as I am unmuted on my end, but apparently can't be heard. Um, and member um, Von Reichbauer, we did, you are not muted on our end, um, but we have received your email and recorded um, that information. Um, Madam Clerk, beyond that, um, are there, um, at the conclusion of our agenda, um, we wanted to make sure that technical difficulties didn't stop any council members from voting. Were there any members excused from votes? No, Mr. Chair, there were not. Um, very well then. Um, then um, having nothing else on our agenda, um, I want to thank everyone who participated. I want to particularly thank um, our council and committee staff who make running online meetings um, virtually seamless for members. And I know there's a lot of behind the scenes work, particularly managing public comment um, and the logistics of organizing and um, hosting the meeting itself virtually. So I want to extend my appreciation and thanks for, to staff for that work. And with that, the Committee of the Whole is adjourned and we may hang up. Thank you.